to be with you again. You know, the, the second lecture is always the one you wonder about because uh, after the first lecture, people have to decide whether they're coming back. So it's great to see all of you this morning. Um, a couple of announcements before we get into the content for today. We have a lot of stuff to go over. The, you'll notice that my lovely wife, Carolyn, is videotaping this. We will, uh, we have a website from the Lakeside Institute of Theology, which is the school in Mexico that I'm the director of. And we will have videotapes of all of these, as well as the PowerPoint presentations will be available free of charge online. We'll be giving you that website later on so that you'll be able to access any of the stuff in case you miss any or you just like them so much you want to go back and see them again. Um, that will be available to you. So we'll let you know that as we go along. Also, I had someone this morning and we do have more of these uh, half-page sheets of the Arabic expressions that Carolyn was, is waving there, my lovely wife Carolyn, she's the Vanna of this outfit. Um, and someone asked me this morning if we could go over these uh, several times before we get to Egypt, uh, actually before Salala will help too, so I'm not prepared to do that, I don't have a slide on that today, but we'll, we'll do that later on in terms of pronunciation in case anybody's interested in that. Today our topic is birthplace of empires. And I've got about 12 hours worth of material here, so we're going to have rip right through it. Um, it's, we're going to look at all of the major empires, especially those that occurred in the Middle East, but there are various other empires that affected this region, like the, the Greeks and Alexander the Great and the Roman Empire, the Mongols coming from the Far East, and so we'll talk about those briefly today. We'll focus more on the way civilization developed and how it expressed itself through major empires. To get you started, though, let me just remind you, these are the talks we're going to be doing uh, today, Birthplace of Empires, this afternoon. Well, today we're talking about sort of the, the geopolitical realities. This afternoon we're going to talk about the religious aspects of this part of the world, uh, faith and culture in the ancient Near East, and I'll explain to you what ancient Near East means as opposed to Middle East this afternoon, so you have to come back. Um, then tomorrow we'll look in the morning at history and culture of Oman, that's prior to us arriving at Salala, Oman, and then unity and diversity in the Middle East. The others will follow after that, children of Abraham, about the three great Abrahamic religions, the monotheistic religions. Moses, the Israelites, in crossing the Red Sea, we'll talk about while we're in the Red Sea, so you'll get that. Introduction to Islam, for those of you who may know some or don't know anything about Islam, we'll sort of start with the basics and give you the history and aspects of the belief. Then, alone in the desert, Christian monasticism, prior to us getting to St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Peninsula. Then Lawrence of Arabia, the Bedouins, and Allied victory in World War I. Mystery of the Nabataeans and Petra, permanence of ancient Egypt, and Pharaoh's temples and tombs before we get to Luxor and on. You know, you, that's enough for now. You can, you can pick up the others as we go along, okay? Um, as I say, we've, with all of these lectures, I broke them up into April lectures and May lectures because the split's right in the middle. So let's talk about the birthplace of empires. Civilization, as we understand it, uh, is almost universally considered to have begun in the area called Mesopotamia. And that is this area right here. The word Mesopotamia literally means the land between the rivers. And those rivers are the Tigris River and the Euphrates River, which ran out of the highlands here in the Middle East. And just to give you a perspective, this is Asia Minor is what we know of as Turkey. This would be uh, Iraq, Syria, Iraq, Iran, uh, Israel. This is Arabia. So that gives you sort of a modern perspective. But this area around the rivers of Tigris and Euphrates was a very fertile area. And this is where somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000 years ago, civilization began. And the reason why we use that range, 3,000 to 5,000 years, is because it depends upon what you consider civilization. It involves some aspects of the first cultivated crops, where they domesticated grains, the first domesticated animals, the use of irrigation, the creation of writing, and especially civilization is defined as when cities began, when people no longer were having to be nomadic uh, travelers, where they would just sort of move based upon where the food was available, but rather they settled down, domesticated animals, domesticated crops, developed irrigation, etc. Now, the first city in the world, there's a lot of dis discussion about what was the first true city in the world. Uh, some people believe it may have been Chateau Hayek in, um, in what we know of as Turkey, Asia Minor. Some people have believed that it could be um, 
Jericho in Israel, but in terms of civilization, uh, there's not much dispute. Uh, Varanasi in Italy, in, uh, Italy, in uh, India, is considered by some the first city. But this area in Mesopotamia, you'll notice the cluster. Some of these cities, Eridu and Uruk, are in the competition for the oldest city, but we do know this was the first part of the world where there were multiple cities, where civilization sort of planted itself, not just in one place, but in multiple cities. And this is where writing began. It is where uh, all of the things that we associate with a civilized world, and particularly, historians will say civilization equals cities, because those two things came together. Now, this area called the Fertile Crescent here, it's called the Fertile Crescent because this area with the, the rivers there was fertile farmland, and it actually proceeds, and I'll show you later on in our, in our uh, lectures, I'll give you another image. It actually is considered proceeding down through Israel, this land bridge between Europe, uh, Asia, and Africa, and down into Egypt, because the Nile River, and we'll talk about that a little today, and then more when we talk about uh, Egypt specifically, that, those were the areas along the rivers where people could grow crops, and those are where the first cities really developed, and the first cultures and civilizations. Now, um, to give you kind of a reference, you'll notice the city of Ur here in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Abraham, who at first was called Abram, left Ur and moved north, at God's insistence, up to an area up here, it's not listed on this map, uh, a city called Haran, and then from there, later on, came back down into this area, um, what we know as Israel today, Palestine or Canaan, as it was known in the, in the old days. So this Fertile Crescent is where civilization really began. Now, one of the things you'll notice, and this is important as we go along talking about all these empires, is uh, you have the Taurus Mountains here in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. You've got the Caucasus Mountains up here north along the edge of the Black Sea. And you've got the Zagros Mountains over here. But because this is all river bottom land, it's all completely open. And because of the fact that once you got past the Zagros, Caucasus, or Taurus Mountains, there was no natural barriers until you got down to the deserts, the Syrian desert and the Arabian desert, that was an open door for anybody who could put together you know, a group of friends to come and invade. Because it was fertile, there were cities there, there was you know, wealth in that place. And so this land, the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, gets conquered over and over and over again. As I say, this is where civilization began in terms of writing. Uh, the earliest writing, which is represented here in an ancient Sumerian text, this is pictographic writing, where the first writing were symbols that were literally little pictures of things. Later on, they developed a, a phonetic writing. This is called cuneiform, which is a Latin expression, which means wedge-shaped. And this, the shift from pictographic writing to cuneiform was a shift from picture writing to sound capturing. The various wedges in cuneiform represent the sounds of words. And so they began to translate the, the names of objects into sounds. And that's how we eventually led to alphabet where we can create any word possible out of 26 letters. It was much more complicated. There are still pictographic uh, languages in the world, particularly Chinese, for instance, where there can be thousands of different characters if you really get into it. So um, the, the imagery you have here down in the corner, you'll notice there are domesticated animals. There's the use of the wheel. Um, this uh, piece here is from Sumeria. It was in Sumeria, this, uh, the Mesopotamian area, that they first developed what we understand as the nuclear family. We take that so much for granted, you know, mother, father, children. And yet there have been cultures down through history that did not perceive that as being the way uh, people live. You may be aware that in Sparta, children very, at a very young age were taken away from their parents and put in a common school. They didn't have that kind of uh, family unit that we think of. Well, they did have that in Mesopotamia. And in fact, this image is a man and woman, a couple, and over them are the deities. In this case, the symbol for the sun god and the moon god. In ancient civilizations, uh, almost all of the ancient religions, we'll talk about that more this afternoon, were based upon people's perceptions of natural phenomena, an effort to try to explain the world and what was happening to them. And the two most common 
of the, the, the things that people recognize as powerful were the, the things that happened in the sky, which particularly, um, can you imagine what the loudest sound people ever heard before amplification came along? What would it have been? Thunder. And so the idea that these loud, awesome things happened in the sky and they could see storms in the mountains, the idea of the sky god was important to them. And that's why you also get the sun and the moon as deities. But the other very important thing was fertility. From the very earliest civilization, they recognized that if women didn't have babies, the tribe was going to die out. And if plants didn't grow, which was related to fertility, then they were going to starve. And so some of the very earliest images that we have are fertility images. This one particularly is called the Venus of Willendorf. Today, this afternoon, we'll talk about the fact that there are tens of thousands of very similar images found all over Asia, Europe, the Middle East. This particular uh, image, at one point, was thought to be the oldest human artifact. It's 24,000 years old. And so the, from the very earliest of human existence that we're aware of, they recognized the need for, uh, for fertility and the idea that it's a woman a woman with pendulous breasts, a woman who is overweight, which means there was plenty to eat. That sort of symbol. We'll talk about that more this afternoon. The very first cities that were built um, were similar to this city. Uh, this is a model of what would have been in ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, you will notice that at these, there are houses out in here, but at the center of each of these cities, they would build a fortified area where the kings and the priests of their religion would live. The This which um, this is a ziggurat or stepped pyramid temple, um, uh, pyramid, stepped pyramid, yes, temple. The, they would uh, come up a certain distance and step in and it would be like that. This was before they created the kind of pyramids you think of, which are like the pyramids of Giza. Um, these exist all over Mesopotamia and the Middle East. In fact, this image down here, for those of you who can see it, that's a photograph of the Great Stepped Pyramid of Ur, which is two, from 2000 BC. It's 4,000 years old. They found it buried under the sand, so it was almost completely preserved, but that's 4,000 years old, and it's real today. In fact, I had one photograph for a while that had an airplane. You could see an airplane flying behind it, but they, they didn't build that. They found it. I mean, modern people didn't build it. And so this idea um, in the ancient cities they would have a fortified central structure. And one of the interesting things you'll notice, is there anything you notice missing amongst these houses down here? There are no streets. They have discovered in some of the ancient things, particularly in like uh, the Chateau Hayek in, uh, in Turkey, that the houses all had sort of central courtyards that you would access by ladders. And when you wanted to leave your house and go to the, to the next door neighbor or down the street, you went up the ladder and you climbed across the rooftops. There were no streets. They would just build all of these right next to each other. I've lived in places that seemed like that, but they were all built right next to each other. But uh, that's what some of the ancient cities looked like. Now, after Mesopotamia, the next oldest culture that we're aware of probably, and at the Indus River Valley, I have to do justice to it, which we're not gonna talk about, uh, the Indus River Valley culture, which was in Pakistan and Western India, they're beginning to believe may be as old as these oldest ones. Uh, but that's it's only been in the last 50 to 100 years that they've known anything at all about that. They're still finding out all sorts of new things. Um, but Egypt, we'll get into more detail later, Egypt is one of the oldest uh, cultures, and as I said yesterday, it is the one that has the longest continuous history from the pre-dynastic ages through the Old Kingdom. We've got down here, if you can see it, the Old Kingdom, which was about 2650 to about 2150, about 500 years. Then they had an intermediate period where the, the there was not one pharaoh over everything. Then a Middle Kingdom, which lasted um, about 400 years. And then an intermediate period where there was not one pharaoh ruling. And then they had the New Kingdom. The New Kingdom, the Old Kingdom is where the pyramids came from. The New Kingdom is everything you're going to see in Thebes, or Luxor, as we know it today. So we'll, uh, we'll deal with some of the, the importance of that, but very important in terms of the history of Egypt was there was one time period, and this was actually the start of the, the pharaohic periods, where 
southern Egypt, or what's called Upper Egypt, here, and that's most of the Nile River Valley. And again, here's another river that was the center of culture because that's where they could grow crops. The Upper Egypt and then Lower Egypt, which is primarily the Delta River of the Nile, those two had been separate areas. Each of them had their own kind of crown, the white crown of Upper Egypt. And it's a little confusing, by the way. We'll talk about this. Upper Egypt is south. And the reason why Upper Egypt is south is because the river flows from south to north. So Up River is south for the Nile. You know, most of us think about like the Mississippi or whatever flows from north to south. That's not the case with the Nile. So Upper Egypt was the southern region. And the person who ruled there wore a white crown. In Lower Egypt, in the north, they wore a red crown. When they finally, in the uh, 3000s BC, when they unified the two, they wore a crown that looked like that. We'll talk about that more. They combined those two crowns into one, and that was seen as the start, really, of the, of the unified Egypt and the history of Egypt. We'll get into that. In, in terms of culture and history, the astonishing thing is the extraordinary organized religion. Organized religion is another aspect of civilization that comes into it. Uh, these, the pyramid and the sphinx from the Old Kingdom, north in Giza, and I'm sorry, we won't be able to see the pyramids, but you will see these kinds of things. All of these are images from the New Kingdom. Um, so this was the highest point of civilization. The Egyptian civilization impressed everyone. The Greeks um, were just astounded by this. The Romans were astounded by this. In fact, as I said yesterday, almost everyone that invaded Greece, even if they conquered them, instead of making the, the or I'm sorry, Egypt, instead of making the Egyptians dress like them and look like them and worship their gods, they all became like Egyptians because the Egyptian culture was so extraordinary and such a long history. And it lasted until about 1000 BC when it began to decline, the last of the great pharaohs was Ramses III, but it continued under other rulers later than that. Now, the first, outside this, the first great empire, and by empire what I mean is some a group that conquered other people, so that it wasn't just them. The Mesopotamians, uh, early on, Sumerians, they were sort of on their own, and they didn't conquer a lot of people. The Egyptians, later on they conquered, but initially they were their own culture. The first conquering empire was the Akkadian Empire. The Akkadian Empire under Sargon the Great. Sargon came along, um, it began around 2350 BC, and it stretched all the way from the Persian Gulf, which you were just in yesterday, from the Persian Gulf all the way up through, where is this? Mesopotamia. Everybody wanted to be at those two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates. And the Akkadian Empire reached all the way up to the Mediterranean Sea. They controlled this entire Mesopotamia. Uh, Sargon started out in the city of Akkad, which is why it's called the Akkadian Empire. And he went in every direction. He conquered people all the way to the sea, all the way down to the Gulf, and, and spread. And no one had ever seen anything like this before. This uh, culture was particular in terms of all of the art that it left behind is almost all military images. You get pictures like this. Um, they were the first people to have mounted soldiers, to use horses for warfare, and so they had mounted archers. Is there anything you notice n missing from this that you might expect? No horseshoe, or no, no stirrups. Uh, if you can imagine riding a horse into battle and shooting a bow and not having any stirrups, then, you know, stirrups were invented much later. In fact, some people have supposed that's one of the reasons that Philip uh, of Macedon, whose son Alexander the Great conquered everybody, that uh, they're not sure, but some people have proposed that they may have actually invented the stirrup, and that gave their, their warriors more control of their horses. But there are all of these military images. This is an image of Sargon um, climbing up on the shoulders of his own soldiers and then trampling on his opponents. <laughs> they developed these spiral ziggurats, um, which they would use as watchtowers as well as for religious purposes. And this is a great image, if you can see it. It's Sargon, and he was so cool and so powerful that he held lions like they were kittens. This is a lion, claws bared and everything, but Sargon just sort of is cuddling the thing because he was so powerful. And so all of these images to talk about how powerful he was how, how powerful his army was and how he conquered and defeated everyone. 
Sargon and then the Akkadian Empire continued until the Babylonians come along. Now, there are two Babylonian empires. The first one, which is called the Old Babylonian, uh, was a group of Am Amorites, they were called. Some of these words you might recognize if you know the Hebrew Bible. Amorites from the south came up. They settled up in the north. Uh, this is the city of Akkad. This is the city of Babylon, which became the capital of the Babylonian Empire. This is the Old Babylonian Empire, and it's well known, especially because of this guy. His name is Hammurabi. Have you ever heard of Hammurabi? Hammurabi was responsible, traditionally, for the first written law code. And the reason why he needed laws is because they had taxation. They had a centralized government. All of his laws were recorded on stone steely or the stone tablets, pillars, that they would mount in different places so people could read what the laws were or have them read to him. Uh, he was the sixth ruler in the old Babylonian kingdom. And it's believed by some that he is referred to in the Hebrew Bible in Genesis by the name of Amraphel, who was the king of Shinar. Shinar being the area, the, the, the Hebrew Bible's name for the area of Babylonia. In fact, this is an image, an artist representation of what the Tower of Babel, Babel, Babylonia, that the Tower of Babel was actually built by Hammurabi. And that's what led to the story that's in the Hebrew Bible. I'm, I'm, I'm relating these things in case you know some of these stories. You might be able to make some connections there. After the old Babylonian Empire, I'm going to jump quite a bit to the west and talk about something that doesn't seem to be Middle Eastern, but it had a big impact. This is the island of Crete. The island of Crete was the place where the first European civilization started, and that was the Minoan civilization. The Minoan civilization began, and the astonishing thing is quite a few of these they had legends about, but nobody really knew if they existed. For instance, there were legends about the Minotaur, who lived in a maze underneath the, the, uh, the castle or the palace of the king, and he fed, fed the Minotaur virgins and all that kind of stuff. Well, all of this was thought to just be legend until a man named Arthur Evans came along in the 1900s, and he insisted, I think there's something to this stuff. So he went to Crete and began looking, and he discovered in 1900 the first great palace at Gnosis on Crete, which is the first evidence of the Minoan culture. Since then, we have found all sorts of um, things about the Minoans. One of the things, however, is that the Minoan language, which is called, the language is called Linear A, has never been translated. They have never deciphered it. Um, the culture of Minoan, how many of you all have been to Crete? Have you been to Crete and seen some of the Minoan palaces and things? They have some, some great displays. The culture, for being the first culture in Europe, was astonishingly developed. Uh, you have these extraordinary pieces of art where it shows that they were a trading people, and they spread from uh, the island of Crete to islands all over the Aegean Sea and to the mainland of uh, what we know as Turkey and of Greece. Uh, this is an image, a representation from the ruins that we have now of what the palace at Gnosis would have looked like. It looks like a modern resort hotel. It's extraordinary. Uh, this disc, the Physos disc, again, they've never translated the language, that disc is in the Archaeological Museum in Athens. Remember I told you there's all these things that you see in the, in the textbooks? You can see that in real life if you go to the Archaeological Museum in Athens. Um, this is an example. These are three Minoan women, and you'll notice they're coiffed and curled, and they've got eye makeup and beautiful gowns. There was one thing kind of unusual about the clothing the women wore in the Minoans. Can you tell what it was? Their dresses were designed to expose their breasts. So, very popular, I imagine. Um, this, this is a very strange thing. They, uh, the, the story of the Minotaur and bulls were very important as a symbol of strength to the Minoans. And there's all of this art that suggests that the bulls were in, that they were involved with bulls in all kinds of ways. In fact, horns are the symbol of the Minoan culture. They apparently, as a sport, would vault over live bulls. Not you know, not like a matador. Um, this is one of the images of these athletes vaulting over the back of a charging bull. So, whatever you know, the, the, the adventure sports. Um, <laughs> and you can see again some of these some of these kinds of things are in the archaeological museum, but a lot of them you would have to go to uh, Crete to see them. So the Minoan culture, the oldest culture in Europe, 
The Minoan culture is believed to have declined probably because of the explosion of Thera, which we now know as Santorini. If you've been to Santorini, you know there's that caldera there where it was a massive volcanic explosion and caused tidal waves. We believe the Minoan culture may have been uh, started a serious and fast decline because of that. And the next great culture, again European, but it affects us, is the Mycenaean culture. This is, this is Crete, and that's Gnosis, where that uh, palace I just showed you. This is the Peloponnesian Peninsula, Athens, where we're headed. There's a land bridge here, Corinth is right there, but Mycenae is the city of the Mycenaean culture. It began around 1600 BC. The king of Mycenae was involved in the, in the assault in Troy because it was his brother that was offended and, and was involved in all of that. So Mycenae is talked about in Homer's Iliad and the story of Troy. Now, the language of Mycenae is called Linear B. Remember, the Minoans are Linear A. Linear B has been translated. And so we have record of a lot of the things that happened there. They began to collapse around 1250 BC, but in the meantime, we have extraordinary uh, records. The city of Mycenae, this is, a, this is what it would have looked like when it was intact, but much of this is still here. Um, you can go to Mycenae, you can visit this. If you're in Athens for more than a day or two, it might be worth seeing if you can get a tour out there. Um, this, right here, this is the main entrance. This is called the Lion's Gate. This is actually it today. This is my lovely wife, Carolyn, saying, and it's this high. <laughs> um, these are two sculpted lions above this huge uh, capstone over the door. And that's why it's called the Lion's Gate. This is another site there, not right in the city, but it's off to, off to the a little ways away, called the Treasury of Atreus. In this wall, as well as in this wall, there are blocks of stone which are like 40 to 50 tons, they estimate. And we have no clue how they got them up there. Um, there are, like in Egypt, we have some idea they may have used dirt ramps, um, the levers, there may be other things. But we have much less idea how they did things here in Mycenae. But this is a, fr a woman that was on a trip with us, and you get some idea how big this is. All right, And that's one piece of stone right there that they got up there 35 feet in the air somehow. Um, this is the hammered gold mask of Agamemnon. It's probably not really the mask of Agamemnon, but you'll see that in the Archaeological Museum in Athens if you go. This is a picture of, they were great sportsmen, they were very, they were a militant, whereas the Minoans were a peaceful trading people, the, the Mycenaeans were a militant organization. They conquered a great deal. They conquered a lot of the islands, they established um, their own colonies in various places. So the Mycenaean culture, and the reason those are both important is because they led to the Greek culture, which affected uh, much of what's happened in this part of the world. The next great empire, again I'm just ripping through empires here, the next great empire was the Hittite Empire. Hittite Empire controlled most of, again, Asia Minor, Anatolia, were the ancient names for it. We know it as Turkey today. All the way from, this is Ephesus kind of area, all the way over through all of this, Hattusa, um, Hattusha in the north was their capital. This was a group of nomadic people who used to live north of the Black Sea and they said, dang it's cold here, let's go south. We hear there's a place called the Mediterranean, much nicer. So they got down into Anatolia and they ended up controlling most of Asia Minor, Anatolia, and much of the Middle East. In fact, there was a period of time in which the two great powers that, that fought each other, because they were both military, were the Hittites and the Egyptians. How many of you have seen Exodus, Gods, and Generals? The new movie that's out, okay? You remember the big battle that they had, the, the chariot battle? That was a real battle, the Battle of Kadesh, which was fought between the Hittites and the forces of Ramses II in Egypt. He was the, he was the like, friend of Moses in, in that movie. Unfortunately, the movie doesn't quite get it right because they suggest that that like they don't get they gets a lot of things wrong, but the, they suggest that the Egyptians clearly won that battle and they didn't. In fact, it was fought to a draw, but it was the largest chariot battle in history. The Hittites actually had invented the chariot. The Egyptians had learned about chariots from them, and then later on they had this huge chariot battle. But what happened is the very you know again these are all military images from the um, the Hittites. The Hittites were the first 
civilization to use iron extensively. In fact, they pretty much issued in the Iron Age. And so they developed iron weapons, they had chariots, and the Egyptians and others learned from them and picked all that up. The fact is that the Battle of Kadesh was such a huge battle, it involved something around 6,000 chariots on both sides, that both the Hittites and the Egyptians sort of were staggered by this battle, neither one of them clearly won, and they both went into a time of recession. In fact, I mentioned to you a second ago that the Ramses III was the last great pharaoh of Egypt. Well, Ramses II, his father, was the one that fought in that battle. And so after that, they started down. Um, and it's interesting that because of the fact that the Egyptians and the Hittites both were staggered by this huge battle, and both of them decided to stay home for a little while, and not, you know, not conquer as much. Um, this, is, this is what the Hittite Empire looked like, and the Egyptian Empire here, and again, you'll notice that it's mostly the Nile River Valley. After these two fought and went into a time of recession, that made room for this tiny little kingdom to grow, and that kingdom was the nation of Israel. During the time of David and his son Solomon, Israel, without the threat from the Hittites in the north or the Egyptians in the south, they had enough breathing room that they expanded, and that was the golden age of Israel under David and Solomon. So all of that is happening around the same time. A fascinating thing about the Hittites, the Hittites are mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, and yet there was no archaeological evidence before the early 1900s. And so a lot of archaeologists, a lot of, a lot of uh, historians said, we don't think they really existed. We think that's just made up in the Bible. In 1906, they found a cache of over 10 thousand cuneiform tablets, and we can read cuneiform, that gave them the history, the details, they started finding some of those images like what I just showed you, and now it's absolutely certain the Hittites existed, they were a major world power, they competed with the Egyptians for uh, rule of the whole western Mediterranean, um, and so everybody had to sort of eat crow a little bit, all those people who've been saying the Hittites don't really exist, and they're still finding things. Um, so that's part of the fascinating stuff. We then come to the time of the, the, you'll notice the Egyptian kingdom down here, we come to the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians, like the Babylonians, had two time periods. The first time period uh, was primarily the, um, in the mid-800s BC, and that's the dark green area. Then they went into a time of recession, and then they came back in the 600s, and they conquered all of Egypt, all the way to the, Mediter to the Persian Gulf, to the Mediterranean and well up in the Assyrians at that time were the largest kingdom that had ever been seen around 1300 BC they really started growing and interestingly uh, uh, one of their leaders named Ashurbanipal is the guy that conquered all of this area I don't know if you can see but can you tell that there's a section here that's in yellow it's not green it's sort of a green yellow and it says Judah Ashurbanipal conquered all of this area except for one place. He, he, they actually, in 722, they destroyed the, the, by that time Israel had been broken up into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom, which very confusingly, was called Israel, and the southern kingdom called Judah. Well, the southern kingdom, with its capital in Jerusalem, was the only area of all of this that Ashurbanipal was unable to conquer. And that the story in the book of Isaiah, in the Hebrew Bible, is that they were parked outside the gates, and the prophet Isaiah tells King Hezekiah of uh, the king of Judah, don't give in. It's all going to be fine. And in the old versions of the Bible, it says, and the next morning the Assyrians woke up to find themselves dead. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, there was, a, it's believed, a plague. Of course, the, the Hebrew peoples, the Jews, believed that this was a blight of God. And they woke up, and so many of the, of the soldiers died, apparently, from an epidemic that Ashurbanipal packed up everything and went back to his home. And it, he, where they were, oh, sorry, was they had been in Asher, and then his descendant Sargon moved it up here to Nineveh. Nineveh is um, the, the city that Jonah, remember Jonah and the whale, Jonah and the big fish? He was on his way to Nineveh to talk to the, Assyri the Assyrians, um, and that all ties in. But that was the only area, this little area of Judah is the only area that the Assyrians were not able to conquer in this whole western Mediterranean region. And in fact, it's the first example of political spin in the world, because in the records that Ashurbanipal left behind, he said, I defeated this king and this king and this king and this king, and I pinned King Hezekiah up behind the walls of his city like a bird in a cage. In other words, I couldn't beat him. The best I could do was, you know, make him go inside his city. 
Uh, well, Ashurbanipal was because, partly because of his retreating and being defeated by this little country of Judah. Um, he was overthrown by his sons. They assassinated him in the temple. And so um, he lost power. These are some of the images from the Assyrians, and you'll see some of these in the British Museum if you go there. Um, this is an example. They were known, the Assyrians were known for their cruelty. They believed the more cruel they could be, the less likely people would be to fight against them. This is an image. These are all relief cuttings. This is an image of a man being flayed alive. They're cutting his skin off. This is an image of a soldier. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't make it. I'm just showing it to you. This is an image of a soldier, an Assyrian soldier, piling up decapitated heads. This is captives being taken off into slavery. And this is the, northern, the king of the northern kingdom of Israel, Jehu, bowing down before Ashurbanipal when they destroyed that kingdom in 722, the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, as I said, this became, became the largest kingdom in history up to that point. They were only defeated by a joint effort by the Babylonians and the Medes. You've heard of Medes and Persians. Well, there was a kingdom of the Medes. Well, the Babylonians had gone into recession after the time of Hammurabi. Now they came back in the Neo-Assyrian Empire. But, I should show you this first. Again, here's this little section of Judah that did not get conquered. This was where the, the, the path as we understand it, that they carried off the Jewish people into exile, the Assyrian exile. Now, have you ever heard of the lost tribes of Israel? This is just, I think, interesting stuff. There were ten tribes of Israel, of the twelve tribes, that were living in the northern kingdom of Israel. They were conquered and carried off into captivity by the Assyrians. The Assyrians, when they conquered somebody, they would take the people off into captivity and force them to intermarry with others, in order to keep the people from, from having a sense of identity anymore and rebelling then. So they carried off the ten northern tribes of Israel into captivity, and they became known as the lost tribes of Israel. The two, uh, there were a few people from other tribes, but in the southern kingdom of Judah, there were two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And by the way, the name Judah is where we get the word Jew, because the kingdom of Judah continued. So all of these northern tribes, which are called the Lost Tribes, it's fascinating that in various parts of the world now, there are groups of people who claim to be descended from those Lost Tribes of Israel. In southern India, there's a group called the Bene Ephraim Jews, who say they're descended from the tribe of Ephraim, one of the Lost Tribes. Um, in uh, northeast India, the Benai Menashe, who say they're descended from the Man tribe of Manasseh. There are the uh, Beta Israel, Falasha, Ethiopian Jews. You remember a number of years ago they had a big airlift of Ethiopian Jews back to the nation of Israel. They claim to be descended from Dan. There are Persian Jews who claim to be descended from Ephraim. There are uh, Igbo Jews in Nigeria who claim to be descended from several tribes. Well, interestingly, they've done genetic tests. And sure enough, these groups have Jewish genetic um, markers in their DNA. And so it is evident that of those lost tribes of Israel that were carried off into captivity, they now exist genetically in various peoples in various parts of the world. I just think that's interesting. Um, so after Assyria, the Babylonians come along. This is the Neo-Babylonian or New Babylonian period. Um, a group from the south called the Chaldeans came north to ba the city of Babylon, rebuilt it, reestablished it. And the first great king that really made the Babylonian Empire, the new Babylonian Empire work, was called Nabopolassar. He's the one who defeated the Assyrians. His son, you may have heard of. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, again, in the Hebrew Bible, um, he was the son of Nabopolassar. He ruled for 43 years, which was a long time back in those days. And they rebuilt the city of uh, Babylon, or Babylonia, and they had, it's believed, as many as 50,000 people living in this one city. Um, enormous walls around it. They had the rivers running right past it. Um, just That's where the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, was said to exist. This is the um, Ishtar Gate from ancient Babylonia, which is now in Berlin. So if you go to the Pergamum Museum in Berlin, this is, a, this is one of the sections of it. They use this beautiful, beautiful coloring and relief carving on this bricks. This is now inside. You'll notice there's fluorescent lights. This is inside the Pergamum Museum in Berlin. So go see it sometime. So Nebuchadnezzar 
This is a photograph of Nebuchadnezzar here on the right. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, whereas the Assyrians were not successful in defeating Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, and the southern kingdom of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar did. He actually conquered the kingdom and was ruling it for a while, but the, the Jewish, um, the Hebrew people kept rebelling against him, and finally he got tired of that, and in 586 he went in, he destroyed the temple of Jerusalem, he destroyed the city of Jerusalem, and he carried the Jewish people off into exile. But unlike the Assyrians who spread the people out and forced them to intermarry and things, the Babylonians took them off into exile and let them stay together. And so later on, after less than 50 years, the, when uh, the Babylonians were defeated by the Persians, the first great Persian king allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem. Now this, this is the Persian Empire. Even more than the Assyrian Empire, one of the largest empires that has ever existed, they conquered all of the um, Anatolia, the Asia Minor, Turkey, all the way over into Macedonia and Thrace, all of Egypt into Libya, all the way over into India. So the Persians conquered everything, and in fact, the fact that they were over here into Macedonia and Thrace and areas along here that the Greeks had controlled, that led to big wars later. In fact, that's the reason that, that Alexander the Great started on his campaign. But the, the Persian Empire, this is the Achaemenian Persian Empire, because there have been several Persian empires, under Darius I, this is uh, Cyrus the Great, Cyrus is the one when he defeated the Babylonians, and that story is in the book of Daniel, in the Hebrew, Hebrew Bible, it's part of it. Um, one of the things, he had a completely different approach to ruling people. He said, as long as you all pay your taxes and don't bother anybody, you can worship the way you want, you can live where you want. This was unheard of. Well, that meant that he gave permission to the Jewish people to return from the area in Babylonia where they had been in, uh, kept, back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. These are some of the other images, some of the soldiers that he had, um, extraordinary Persian art as well. You see some similarities between that and the Assyrian. Um, now, again, all of this area had been controlled by Persia, but the Athenians, the Athenian, at this point, uh, Greece is all city-states. There, there was not a nation of Greece, every uh, city, in Greece, because it's so mountainous if you've been to Greece, they were isolated from one another for the most part, and all of these different city-states in Greece were their own government. After the fall of the Mycenaean civilization, around 730 BC, these Greek city-states started growing, and they fought each other from time to time, and then once every four years they would get together for uh, sports, to show that they were better at things than the other guys without actually fighting in battle. Those were called the Olympics. That's where the Olympic Games came, because these various city-states would get together every four years and compete with each other without fighting um, to show that they were stronger and faster and whatever. Um, these cities, especially Athens, Sparta, Corinth, and Thebes, they developed and they grew. Um, they, particularly Athens, became very powerful, and it started trying to tell everybody else what to do. And they, the, the various, this is called the Ionian Coast. The reason this is a different color is because after Troy, the Battle of Troy, the Greeks had settled various cities along this Ionian coast. Well, once the Persians had conquered all this, they kept having troubles with these Greek cities along the Ionian coast, places like Ephesus, which was a Greek city, even though it was in Asia Minor. They kept rebelling and causing problems. So finally, the Persians come in and they conquer the Ionian cities. And they said, if we're going to put a stop to this, we need to uh, root it out at the source, so we need to defeat Athens. So they crossed the sea, and the Persian army was considered undefeatable. To everyone's astonishment, especially the Greeks, they actually beat the Persian army at the Battle of Marathon. And you know the story of Marathon? Everybody was so shocked that they actually won this battle that one of the soldiers ran 26 miles back to Athens to report, you know, we are victorious, and then he fell over dead. <laughs> Which, as I said before, is exactly what I would do if I ran 26 miles. That's where we get the modern marathon. That's why the modern marathon is 26 miles long, because that's the distance from the plains of Marathon to the city of Athens. And they were just astonished. Well, the Persians weren't going to take that line down, so they decided instead of taking boats over, we're going to march around and we're going to come down from the north, and there's a pass at Thermopylae. Did you all see the movie 300? Okay, rippling abs, you know, the whole thing, Gerard Butler. 
Okay, you must not have seen it. <laughs> the uh, 300, the, the legend is, that 300 of the Spartans, along with some Thebans and others, uh, stopped in this narrow pass. They stopped, for a period of time, the entire Persian army, which was extraordinary. And there's a, apparently it was a true saying. The king of Persia sent word to them and said, we are so powerful that our arrows will blot out the sun. And one of the senior Spartan warriors said, then we will fight in the shade. <laughs> and they held them, these 300 guys with some help from some Thebans, held them off long enough for them to evacuate Athens and do some other things. Well, they evacuated Athens, the Persians burned Athens, and they were sort of ripping through everything. And Athens was primarily a naval power. And so they ended up fighting a battle here in the Gulf of Salamis, the Battle of Salamis, and the Athenian Navy defeated the Persian Navy. Well, they were counting on the Navy to resupply them and everything, so the Persians ended up going back home. And Athens grew in power and grew in influence. In fact, they got so influential, they kept trying to tell all the other city-states what to do after that. Sparta, down here, got tired of it, and that led to the, the next war, which the, the war between the Greeks and the Persians is called the, the, the Greek Persian, the Persian Wars. Then they had the Peloponnesian Wars, because this is called the, the Peloponnesian Peninsula, where Sparta and Athens were fighting each other. Well, Athens was a great sea power. Did I say this yesterday? Athens was a great sea power. Sparta was a great land army. Well, Pericles, the leader of the Athenians, he had a wall a fortress, fortified wall built all the way around Athens, all the way to the coast of Piraeus, which I think is like 26 kilometers, if I remember right. And there were fortified walls all the way. Well, the Spartans couldn't get in to fight on land with the, uh, the Athenians, and the Athenians kept fighting sea battles, and it's been said that it was like a war between an elephant and a whale. And so these two armies kept at it until Pericles died from, a, from an epidemic and the people after him weren't so wise they decided to march out and, be, and fight the Spartans and the Spartans whipped up on them really badly and that ended the Peloponnesian War. But the, Greek, the Persian War and the Peloponnesian Wars were written about by Herodotus, the Greek historian in the 5th century and uh, BC and then uh, Thucydides. Herodotus and Thucydides invented modern history as we understand it. That is, to take an objective view, not to tell just one side, to give a series of events in chronological order. He, they invented history, and it was because of those two wars. We then have Alexander the Great. I'm going to skip over this pretty quick because I'm going to give you a whole talk about Alexander the Great. His father, Philip of Macedon, the most underrated figure in all of history, as far as I'm concerned. Everybody talks about Alexander, but if it had not been for his father, Philip, nothing would have happened with Alexander because... He's the one that, that created the method of warfare that put together the army, but then he got assassinated in 336 BC, and his son, who was still very young, ended up taking over the army. This is apparently what he really looked like. It, it was said that he was loved by women and men alike. <laughs> and he ended up traveling through the large, and creating the largest empire in history. All of Greece, all of Thrace, Macedon, a lot of what we consider as, as Eastern Europe, all of the area, he defeated the Persians, and he never fought a battle where he was not outnumbered at least five to one, and he never lost. But on the way back from his travels, you know, they traveled, it was, they fought for 10 years. They got all the way over here to India. He wanted to go all the way to, to the great ocean, and his soldiers, after 10 years of, almost 11 years of battling and traveling, they went, Al, 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 let's go home. We're tired of this. And so they started home. They got as far as Babylon, which is uh, Babylonia, which is what he was going to make the capital city of his new empire. And he dies at 32. Okay? The old saying, you know, by the time Alexander the Great was my age, he'd been dead for 26 years. Okay? So he dies, and he leaves no successor. He had no children. And so his generals, I say it in his deathbed, they gathered around him to say, Alexander, who is your heir? Who is to take over the empire when you die? And the story is that he said, to the strongest. Well, that meant war. And we end up with the War of the Diadochi, where the various generals of Alexander fought each other. They ended up, ultimately, this shows several of them. There was Seleucus, uh, Ptolemy took over Egypt. Seleucus had um, much of India, Iraq, Iran, 
Um, and then this is the kingdom of Antigonus Monophthalmus. Monophthalmus because he only had one eye. And Antigonus finally got pushed out, and it ended up being Seleucus, um, the Seleucid Empire up here, and the Ptolemaic Empire down there. And again, they became, in, in Egypt, the Ptolemaic people became Egyptian, because remember Cleopatra? We'll talk about that. Cleopatra was a descendant of Ptolemy. She went yet, she's about as Egyptian as anybody can think of. So they controlled all, the generals controlled all the world. Another Persian Empire rose up, the Parthian Empire, and they ended up being the only thing that stopped the next great empire, the, the Romans, from continuing to take over Asia. Because the Parthians handed the Romans the worst defeat they had ever had in the Battle of Parai. The, Parth uh, the Parthians defeated uh, the Ro Roman general Marcius Licinius Cassius. He had a 40,000-man army, and they killed 30,000 of the Roman soldiers in that one battle. And the Romans said, maybe we won't mess with them anymore. <laughs> and in fact, it's kind of interesting. If you, if you look at, um, you see this is the edge of the Parthian Empire. <clears throat> that will fit in really well right there if you match those two up. The Romans and the Parthians sort of butted up against each other, and that kept the Romans from going further. But, as they said, the Roman Empire, which had grown, I won't get into the details of the Roman Empire, um, they, they had turned the Mediterranean into a Roman lake. And so they ruled. Um, it's interesting that Rome started out as a monarchy. They had a king up until, uh, for the first uh, 250 years of their existence. And in the 500s BC, they had a king called Tarquinus Superbus. I wonder what he thought of himself. Tar Tarquinus Superbus. And he raped a noblewoman. And the, no, the noble men drove him off and said, we will never have another king. And the leader of that effort to get rid of the king, who said we'll never have another king, was named Brutus. Well, later on, they had 500 years after that of the Republic, where they had a, you know, senators that ran it. There was no king. Then Julius Caesar comes along. Caesar conquers the Gauls. He's leading an army. The army is following him. He comes in, he, he doesn't become emperor. Julius Caesar was not the emperor, but he was sort of the dictator. And a good friend of his, whose name was Brutus, who was a descendant of the Brutus who said 500 years earlier, we will never have another king. Brutus was convinced by his friends that you have an obligation to your ancestors in what they declared. And so Brutus ended up leading the assassination of Julius Caesar. After Caesar died, his heir was Octavius. Octavian took his name, Gaius Julius Caesar Octavi Octavius, and the army followed him instead of Mark Antony, who they thought was going to be the leader. Mark Antony runs for it, and he goes down to Egypt, which was controlled by Rome at the time, and he hooks up with Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. And so Octavius and Mark Antony have this big sea battle. Mark Antony loses. He and Cleopatra end up dying. And Octavius becomes the first of the great Caesars. He takes on the name Augustus after that. Um, after good, good emperors, bad emperors, all sorts of things, we finally get into the period of time. Uh, we're looking at the the early two hundred or the late two hundreds here. They get an emperor in Rome named Diocletian, and Diocletian says, and they had had twenty seven emperors in the forty years before Diocletian. That doesn't sound, and most of them had been assassinated. 27 emperors in 40 years. He says, the problem is you can't rule all this anymore, one person. So he breaks it up into uh, two great sections, the line being right here. And in each half, there was a senior uh, emperor called the Augustus, and a junior emperor called the Caesar. And the idea was, uh, the, the problem was they had no good plan of succession. Well, whenever the Augustus had served for 20 years, he was going to hand it over to the Caesar, who would become the Augustus, and then he would name a Caesar. And so it was a good plan, and it made it easier to manage. The only problem was the junior emperor in the West was named Constantius. His son, who ran the army for Constantius, didn't like the idea that he was going to have to wait 20 years in order to be ruler over even half of it. His name was Constantine. And Constantine first defeated the forces of Maximian in the, in the west, and then he ended up defeating Galerius. He took over, over the whole empire, united it all by 324, and he moved the capital 
here to uh, what was known as Byzantium. It then got renamed uh, Constantinople after Constantine. He unified the empire again, and that continued. Later on, they did divide it up after his death. Um, I'm going to get into some of this stuff later. Then, in somewhere in the 400s especially, it seemed like anybody that had three friends and a pair of boots decided they could whip up on Rome. And so they did. And you get all of these various invasions of the Visigoths and Vandals and Huns and Astrogoths and Franks and everybody else, all of these barbarian people. So that in the 400s, the city of Rome was sacked twice and the Western power really, you know, that's the start of what's called the Dark Ages, although that's not considered politically correct anymore because there were some good things that happened in the Dark Ages. But at the same time that all that was happening here in the West, in the East, with the, the capital in Constantinople, the Eastern Roman Empire, which became known as the, the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, continued. You had all of these various groups, the Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Franks, Burgundians, the Vandals, the, you know, etc., controlling the West. In the East, it was still the Roman Empire, the Byzantian Roman Empire. Now, the interesting thing is that after or around 500 AD, almost all of these groups became Christians. They all stopped being pagans and they accepted the religion that they had learned by conquering Western Europe and they became Christians. So that by the 500s, you end up with uh, Christian, what had been pagan peoples in the West and in the East, you have, based in Constantinople, the great Byzantine Golden Age. Uh, particularly, this is Justinian and his wife, Theodosius, um, and, um, I'm sorry, not Theodosius, uh, Theodora. Theodosius was a later emperor. Theodora. Theodora was 29 years younger than her husband. She had been a prostitute, so you know it was really popular when she became the empress. Um, and they rebuilt much of what had been the Roman Empire. He's the one, they're the ones, that built the Hagia Sophia, this extraordinary church that you must go visit if you haven't been there. That's it. Well, oops. That's it from outside. This is what it looks like inside, and those are people right there. Those little tiny things. Again, underneath that dome, the Statue of Liberty could stand minus the minus the torch. It's huge, and this was built in the 500s. This is the same guy, Justinian, who also had the monastery of St. Catherine's built, and uh, extraordinary art. Now, when the the Turks took over from in Constantinople, they painted over all the Christian icons, but. Later, Ataturk in the 1920s, when he was trying to make Turkey into a new nation and relate to the West, he had all that uncovered and they turned it into a um, museum instead of a, a mosque. This was the Byzantine Empire under Justinian. See, they took back much of what had been the Roman Empire, not all of it. This was that same outline. And the yellow areas here, yellow and green, that's where Christianity had spread by 565 AD. So all of these Franks and Vandals and all these the Visigoths have become Christian. Then in 570 is born a man named Muhammad and Muhammad at age 40 begins to get a revelation he believes from God that he is supposed to rid the world of pagan idolatry. He is supposed to correct the errors that were made by the Jews and the Christians and so he begins a campaign this dark orange area, including Oman. Oman is very proud of the fact that they were some of the early converts to, to Islam. The, he created that early empire. The yellow part was then the next four um, caliphs or successors after Muhammad conquered much of the rest of the Western Mediterranean over into Persia, all of the, all of the uh, Arabian Peninsula, and then the green areas were then conquered by many of the subsequent uh, rulers of Islam. We'll talk about all that under Islam. You will notice there was a time when Islam conquered almost all of the Iberian Peninsula, that's Portugal and Spain, and they sent armies all the way up into uh, near Tours in France. They were beaten back from France by a man named Charles, Charles Martel. Charles Martel was the grandfather of a man named Charles the Great, who we know as Charlemagne, who became the Holy Roman Emperor and all of Western Europe was unified under him. And the reason that he got that power is because they were the, his grandfather and his father and him were the ones that were able to push the Muslims back out of Western Europe and stop their conquering. Um, 
Christianity in 1054 splits between what we know as Roman Catholicism, based in the West, and Eastern Orthodoxy, based in the East, with the capitals being Constantinople in the East and Rome in the West. The, the Islamic powers have not stopped at that point, though. They still continued in the East, even though they've been pushed back out of Western Europe. And the Seljuk Turks, they're called Turks because originally they came from Turkmenistan. They came over, they were soldiers at first for hire for some of the Islamic rulers in what we know of as the Iraq area. They ended up taking over. They then conquered almost all of Asia Minor down through the Middle East. And in 1096, Constantinople had these armies. It was a Christ still Christian Byzantine Constantinople. The armies of Islam, the Seljuks, were right outside their gates. And they called out to the Pope in Rome, because the West had recovered by this time, and said, help, we've got the Muslim armies right outside our gates. That started the Crusades. I'm going to do a talk about the Crusades. There is no period of history more misunderstood than the Crusades. The Crusaders came in, and by 1100, they had both reconquered part of Asia Minor and given it back to the Byzantine Empire, and they had established the Crusader states along the areas we know of as Israel, Jerusalem, uh, uh, Acre, and others. We'll get more details. The Mongol Empire started in the Far East, became the largest empire ever, all of China, uh, almost all of Asia, all the way into Europe. And the thing about the Mongols that is pretty significant, unlike everybody else that would conquer and then try to take advantage of the wealth that they had conquered, the Mongols seemed to be bent on just destruction. They ended up killing almost everybody that they conquered. In fact, they had a 130,000 strong army, uh, starting with Genghis Khan and then his descendants, including the Kublai Khan, uh, uh, Hord uh, Horduga Khan, and others that were leaders and generals. It's believed that the, the Mongol army was responsible for as many as 60 million deaths. They would conquer an area and kill everybody. It's believed that one-fifth of the population of China died under the Mongols, just as an act of war. Almost half the population of the Iranian uh, plateau was killed. Uh, the area of Mesopotamia that they conquered, it used to be irrigated. They destroyed most of the irrigation system there, and much of that's never been replaced. So it was a massive kind of destruction, uh, unlike anything that had come before. Then, the, uh, after the Mongols retreated back to the east, again, they weren't concerned about settling any place. They wanted to conquer it, and then they went back. The Turks grew back to power under the Ottomans. One of the young, a prince called Osman, who was part of the Seljuk movement, launched his own empire, an Islamic empire called the Ottoman Empire, and for many years, for almost 100 years, they conquered Eastern Europe. They were right at the gates of Vienna. You know, that's how far the Muslim control went. They controlled all of Eastern Europe. And uh, in 1580, Suleiman the Magnificent controlled all of this area, a huge um, area of land and population. But then the Ottoman Empire, who had gone as far as the gates of Vienna, became known as the sick old man of Europe in the 1800s. They were unable to control the lands. They kept being pushed back. Countries kept declaring their independence, and the Turkish uh, Ottomans could not seem to do anything to fight back. They were pushed almost entirely out of Europe, except for a small area around Istanbul, and they controlled this area when we got to the First World War. I'm going to give a talk about all of that when we talk about Lawrence of Arabia. I'm sorry, I have to go real quick skipping over this stuff. But the Ottoman Empire ended um, at the end of the First World War, and the Ottoman Empire was broken up into various uh, pieces, and we'll talk about all of that, but uh, Islam continued to be the dominant religion in those areas. But that brings us up to pretty much the modern age and the 20th century. Any questions about any of that? Uh, I always get a laugh on this talk when I, when I do that. I'm sorry I've got a few minutes over. Is there anything particular? And you can come up to me afterwards as well. Was there a question? Okay, my apologies for doing all of this. Yes? Were, were very brutal, uh, beheadings and so on and yes. so forth. How much is ISIL mimicking that now? I don't know that there's, well, they don't see themselves as related to the Assyrians. I mean, uh, there are still Assyrians, by the way, and the Assyrians are one of the groups of people, there's a small population, that are persecuted um, by that. So I don't see the, think they would see themselves as in any way linked to that. Um, 
any conquering people down through history, um, brutality has been the part of it. And so I don't think ISIL has any particular relationship to that. I mean, they, they see themselves as the soldiers of Islam, although none of the rest of the Muslim world supports that. I mean, the people that are fighting most against them are other Islamic countries. So if you, uh, we're going to talk about in the, the when you talk, talk about Islam and also unity and diversity, about the fact that so many people have this, this idea that the Middle East, and they're all Arabs, they all speak Arabic, they all have the same religion, and it's this monolithic thing. Nothing could be further from the truth. The, the greatest enemies against ISIL and Al-Qaeda Al as well. In fact, ISIL used to be part of Al-Qaeda, and they got too rough for Al-Qaeda, and Al-Qaeda threw them out. And so that's when that split occurred. Uh, they were too radical for Al-Qaeda. And so, yeah, there's so much difference there. I don't think they would see, I mean, they may look back and say, well, that worked for them, So, but I don't think they see themselves as in any way connected to the Assyrians. Yes? How did Romania remain a uh, Western uh, Roman? How did Romania? Yeah, Romania remained a uh, Western uh, Catholic. Actually, most of Romania is Orthodox. In fact, on the last trip we had here, the, the uh, destination uh, manager, or, you know, it's now called the uh, voyage director, um, he was Romanian Orthodox, and he, had ta he talked to me about the fact that at one point he thought he might become a priest. There are still Catholics there, but then there are Catholic enclaves, you know, and, and Catholics that exist throughout that. But much of Romania, there is an Orthodox Church of Romania, uh, Romanian Orthodox. So, yeah, they've, they've maintained that as well. But, yeah, there are Catholics all over. Um, as well as Orthodox. Thank you all very much. I'm available for questions. This afternoon we'll look at faith and culture in the Middle East.